guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop, Knights of Glory by Blue Gear Games. Plays two to five players, takes about 15 to 45 minutes, and is for ages eight and up. In the game Knights of Glory, much like other Press Your Luck games, like Ink and Gold and Celestia, you're attempting to try and go as far as you can along a path without failing, and you can fail by having people call your bluff. You don't always have to bluff though, and sometimes it's a good idea not to, by placing weapon cards down, face down, and then hopefully having the right combination, or bluffing your way into the right combination, and successfully going from one tier of the dungeon to the next to the next, and finally to the exit. If you can get from the start of the dungeon to the end of the dungeon, you will succeed in escaping. Now that doesn't mean everybody else is out, that simply means that they have one more turn to try and get out of the dungeon, which things happen, the walls start collapsing from the lower floors, and as people escape, other people will either not make it or be crushed in the rubble in some terrifying way. The game Knights of Glory is a fast-paced little uh, deduction style game with a little bit of bluffing as well. Will you succeed in escaping the dungeon? I don't know. Let's go ahead and take a look down below at what you get. So here we have Knights of Glory and it's all set up for two or three players depending on which you want to play. Uh, as you can see down below you're going to have the tier one, two, and three dungeon cards as well as a stack of weapon cards. When you're playing with two or three players you're going to take out one of each of the basic type of weapon cards along with half the wild cards and half Half the gestures from the deck. If you wanted to play with a four and five player game, you'd simply add these cards into the deck and shuffle it. The game is also going to consist, consist of five player pawns, and every player is going to get to choose one of these colors, along with taking two of the same colored cards. One is going to be an X, and one is going to be a check mark. That is going to signify whether you believe somebody is bluffing or not in the game. Uh, you're also going to get four die, the rule book, a first player starting marker, and cogs that can help you get across the dungeon. I'll go ahead and take these guys out now that we're no longer needing them, along with we'll just take two random colors. For the setup of the game, you're simply going to take all these guys and set them aside, and each player is going to get their two colors here, and we'll place them down below as such, indicating each of the players to have these cards. You're also going to take the starting space, or starting card, and place it in front, uh, and then you're going to place two random tier ones, two random tier twos, two random tier threes, and then finally the exit, so it looks like a snake-like pattern going like this. And you're trying to get to the exit. After you've done that, everybody's got their cards along with these here. You're going to take a hand of cards from this deck here, as well as the most experienced player is going to take this marker, signifying the start of the game. Let's go ahead and take it now down below, and I will show you how to play. Okay, so I'm ready to show you a three-player game of Knights of Glory, and like we said before, we chose Blue to go first because he's the most experienced. Everybody has five weapons cards to begin the game, and all of their pawns are on the start space. Blue has three options on his turn. His first option is he can advance from one space to the next, which will take him to the tier one dungeon space. He could choose to discard a card or cards from his hand based on the tier of room he's in. Uh, in a tier one, it's one card you can discard from your hand, two is two, and three is three. However, you cannot use that action when you're on the start space. And the last action is you can choose to pass, meaning you do not want to do anything. Since there seems to be only one main action for him to take, he will simply choose to advance. The cards in his hand are going to be based on the weapons that are going to be found in the rooms, wilds and jokers. Jokers do not have any useful effect, but if you can bluff them across, you are going to get a gear token, which you can use as a wild to advance farther along the dungeon. Wilds are played face up and can block a card of a dungeon type or a weapon type that can prevent you from escaping. So these basically count as any type of weapon. Very, very useful. So he's chosen to advance, which means when you advance to a, a space, you're going to flip this over, place this guy here, and then you're going to look at the specific type of dungeon. This one here says you need a shield and also it needs to roll a die, one singular die, in fact. Roll, and that is going to symbolize a key, in which case he needs a shield and a key in order to pass this challenge. He's going to look in his hand and see what he has. He has a shield and he happens to have a wild. So you can choose to play that wild to block the key. And then he's going to play this card face down as a shield, potentially. Everybody is now able to then choose one of their two cards in hand, whether it be a blue or a green check mark or a red X. If both players choose to play these face down and flip them over, then this player is going to succeed this challenge regardless of what this is. 
However, if one player chooses to use an X and the other does a check mark, then basically what is going to happen is he will reveal his cards. In this case, he is not bluffing. Anybody who says he is bluffing will have to go back a space, and anybody who said he wasn't will be just fine. After that happens, the player will advance as normal, and these cards will return to the other player's hands. Then this player will now have a chance to continue. These cards here he played get discarded. So he now has his three cards remaining. He's got a wild, a sword, and a torch. So he can actually choose if he'd like to try and advance past the next tier dungeon. We'll go ahead and do that. So we now come across a death room or danger room, in which case it has a little skull symbol. If he fails in this room, he goes back to start. However, there is no symbol for weapons on here, just a singular die. So he will roll this one die. It's a blank, which means he is guaranteed to succeed this. He doesn't need to place any cards down and he's fine. He will choose now to pass. The next player is now going to get an opportunity to go. And this player is going to go ahead and choose to advance as well. And it's going to simply repeat the process up until players are going to get across different rooms. So now that you have an idea of how to play, I'll show you some other rooms. So this room here is going to actually be a death room just like this one, but it has a blue symboled die, which means if you want, you can roll an extra die. This one is a mandatory one, but if he or she wants, the player can roll an extra die. And if they succeed the room with that extra die, they're going to get a cog token. Other ways you can get a cog token is calling a player's bluff and being right about them bluffing or another way is you can gather it from pushing in a joker card so if you have a joker card face down as a bluff and nobody thinks you're bluffing you get this joker or sorry jester card across then you're going to score a cog for each one very very useful because these can be used to block out symbols one for each cog and that's the basic idea there's gonna get more challenging as the rooms go across up to the point where you're going to have to get to the exit if you get to the exit you will have to not bluff you actually have to roll all the die and of course you can choose to use the cogs to block the spaces you'll also have wilds but you must not bluff and if you do not bluff you will succeed in getting to the end in which case this player would be like okay i've got these and he in fact did have these symbols he'd be safe now what happens is the start space will get removed and everybody's gonna have a turn left to go through the rooms. If they do not advance all the way to the end, they're probably going to perish. But maybe if somebody, somebody looks something like this, there might be an opportunity. If this player managed to succeed in getting here as well, the next room would collapse and anybody in those collapsed tiers are going to basically be removed. So we would go start for the first player, tier one for the second, tier two for the third, and tier uh, three for the fourth player, which means in a five player game, there's no way everybody can succeed. After that, everybody's had their turns because you will no longer be able to do anything or, or you're not gonna be able to draw any cards or pass. If you do not make it on that last round, you're simply going to be done, in which case, Anybody who survived the uh, the dungeon and made it to the exit is going to win the game Knights of Glory. Uh, one last thing, too, is after every single round, players are going to draw up to their to total hand size and start again with the person who is in last place, which maybe be yellow, is going to begin the round. Otherwise, though, I think you have a basic idea of how the game works. Let's come up and talk about it. So, some caveats now before we get into the review portion of this section. First thing I want to say is, the round consists of everybody taking a turn, or an action, and afterwards, everybody's going to drop back up to their maximum. If there is a discard pile and no deck, you'll shuffle the discard pile and you will draw up to five cards. Those are the only that's the only time in the game in which you're going to draw cards. Once somebody gets to the end, there is no more drawing cards. Whatever you have in your hand is what's left over, you have one turn to complete. And remember, you can always choose to advance until, in which case, somebody catches your bluff or you don't have enough cards to advance. There's also a little nifty thing I want to talk about is I originally reviewed this game a while ago with uh, some different changes now attached to this as well as some improved card art and etc etc coming back to get another glimpse, glimpse at it. So I want to talk about some new rule changes. The first thing is at the end of the game, if you have jesters in your hand and you are, it's then somebody has ended, those jesters become cogs, which is very useful. The start space is now basically the new cell space. In a lot of ways, that, that original space that was behind the start is gone, which I'm, I'm very glad about that. 
Uh, and instead, whenever you fail to guess that somebody is bluffing at the start, you're going to discard a weapon. You can't, you cannot vote if you're at the start space and don't have a weapon in hand. There's a couple other start space rules as far as that goes. The starting player marker, instead of getting passed clockwise, will now go to the player who is in the last position, and so on and so forth. So there's a couple unique little additions that have been changed throughout the game, which have overall improved the quality of the game. This game, Knights of Glory, is basically a pusher luck bluffing type of game in which you want to advance as fast as possible along the tracks up until the very end in which you no longer can bluff and you have to kind of have the cards needed to escape and hopefully you've done well enough throughout the game to which point you'll have a lot of cogs or a lot of wild cards which you can use to substitute for the random die rolling that is the final space and escaping doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be the only winner others can win as well Games like Celestia and Ink and Gold are very similar to this game with some unique differences. In Ink and Gold, it is kind of you're all by yourself and you're just trying to continue as much as you can to get all the treasures that you want up until maybe you bust, maybe you and other people bust. This game doesn't function like that. This is you all by yourself going from cell to cell, hoping to achieve victory and other players are determining whether or not they think that you have the cards that you may or may not have in your hand. Celestia, on the other hand, is kind of a cooperative game in which you're trying to kind of steer an airship together with each other's moving from space to space, which kind of has this feel as well. But instead of cooperatively working together to give players cards and succeed in challenges, you are accomplishing these challenges all on your own in this game, and you are progressively getting more and more challenging. So it has both feels of both games, but the idea is very unique in how it functions, as well as the board starts kind of falling apart. The, the start space gets removed from the first player, and the second player gets across and the first tier gets removed. So players are going to kind of run into pitfalls so they do not make it far enough into the game. Now regardless though, if you don't make it to like tier 2 or even tier 3 by the point somebody has actually gotten out of the dungeon, it's very, 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 very unlikely you're going to succeed in getting out. But there are chances that that can happen because the die have blank, blank spaces. So you know, never, never know. And based on the cogs you may or may not have, that will help you as well. Saving is important in this game, as well as the fact that there is a limited number of cards for the deck based on the number of players. And when you have cards in your hand, you're going to have an idea of what other people have in their hands and what they may or may not be bluffing. So there's a lot more known information in this type of a bluffing game. That is going to appeal to some of you and will not appeal to others. You'll be like, hmm, I have two keys. And I know that there's only two keys in the deck. So he he needs a key, so he either has to have a wild, or he doesn't have it. That makes me think he's most likely bluffing, right? Or he's going to play that cog on that key, okay, that means he probably has a shield, so he's probably going to succeed this, I'm going to let him pass. So for a bluffing game, there's a lot more known information, and as long as you can keep a good, strong, keen eye on what people are playing and how they're playing them, you have a very good idea of knowing when somebody's bluffing when they're not. Now that's not always to say that, because those wild cards can be useful, as well as sometimes people, may you might think they're actually they actually have the cards they need, but in fact they do, and they're choosing to play the Jesters instead so that they can get cogs to utilize later in the game. It's a smart strategy that people like to use a lot. I really, really enjoyed this game. Uh, it's It's got a lot of really unique factors. Uh, I, I like the other two, Celestia and Ink and Gold, about as much as this type of a game. Uh, now, this one here, though, is definitely more of a competitive game. Uh, you're really, really gunning for the players trying to determine if they're bluffing or not because you want to push them back. Because every time you push them back, you get to move forward, you can gain cogs, and you keep them from getting that extra lead. Now, they may or may not have the extra cards they need, so there's a little bit of luck in this game as to what cards you draw. If you have a bunch of wilds in your hand at the beginning of the game, you're very much more likely to succeed in getting through to the next goal, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win, because bluffing is all about choosing the card you want to play. Anyway, I think you have an idea of this game. I think there's going to be an audience. If This is this audience is going to know they want to play this game. If you like those two games I already explained previously, this is one I wouldn't pass up, provided you don't mind a little bit more of an aggressive nature of a, this type of a game. Overall, I really really enjoyed this game 
and uh, I think I before gave it a seal of approval. And yet again, it gets my seal of approval. I really, really like push your luck games, and this one is no exception. All right, guys, thanks for watching another Unfilthy Gamer board game review. Go ahead and check out this video along with others here on your YouTube live channel. Blah, 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 blah. Subscribe and comment and all that other stuff. Click the little bell thingy and whatnot, as well as taking a look at Knights of Glory, a push your luck competitive game of bluffing, deduction, and deception. And you can also go ahead and check out our website, unfilteredgamer.com. Tons of blog posts, giveaways, kicks, lists, and more as a live play. We live play these type of games all the time every Wednesday. 7 30 p.m pst we also give away a ton of games on that live stream and if you want we've got a patreon now give us a dollar give us a dollar eh? is it worth it maybe I don't know, that's up to you also all right guys that's all i got as always i look forward to being a knight of glory with you next time bye